Let me introduce Bill Platt. Bill Platt is a, the program specialist um, at the Red Cross. Uh, he'll tell you a little bit about his background, and uh, he does trainings frequently throughout the community in the area. Um, and so, Bill, thank you for working with us this summer. Um, tonight is the first requirement for the program. Um, and then there are some modules that Bill will be telling you about that you'll need to complete over the summer. And then we will wrap up with a simulation drill sometime the week of August 20th. And we're going to figure out the date before you guys leave tonight, hopefully, or by tomorrow, and send it out to you so you know. Um, so that'll be the wrap up event. That'll be for the, if you're interested in the certification, the training, for, and only the training, that's kind of the wrap up of that certification piece. Um, if you're interested in the independent study, uh, there are two forms you need to fill out tonight and give back to me. Um, and there's a little bit more reading beyond the modules. There will be two articles. One's the, uh, an article that you already picked up back there, or it's back there if you're interested in it. Um, and the other article I'll send you electronically. And then there's a book as well, and all that's listed on one of those forms under bibliography. Okay. Um, and then there will be a wrap-up piece that you'll do for the class related to um, a final paper or a final oral <coughs> conversation about um, how you see what you learn in the training applying to, potentially applying to the, the level of counseling the site you, you would be working at in the future, okay? How you might be able to apply it as a professional counselor in the future, okay? Or how it might help inform you um, as you support folks um, in whatever setting you're in, uh, if there's a disaster in your community or in your agency, school. Okay. All right, so happy to talk a little bit further if folks have questions about that independent study piece. But at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Bill so he can um, jump in the PowerPoint for tonight. And um, I believe it's the materials or the instructions and how to get into the module. It's just a job aid for troubleshooting, okay. but we will talk about that okay. in detail. So that, Bill just sent me that right before to, uh, this, this time. Um, and I sent it out to you electronically just a few moments ago via email. So that'll be in your email um, when we go back. Okay. So quick question, anybody in the witness protection program? You are, okay, you have to stay out of the video tonight, just so you know. <laughs> you just pretend like you did, or use a fictitious name when you get. So welcome. My name is Bill Platt. I am the Disaster Program Specialist with the Red Cross. I have been with the organization 38 years this year. I started as a kindergartner, I'm just kidding. I started in high school as an intern with the American Red Cross doing um, communications or what's now called public affairs. And I have worked my way through many different things in the agency or the organization. I was uh, previously in the mid 90s, I was a professional health and safety instructor and I talked in industry, first aid CPR. I've done a lot of other things in my life but everything that I've done in my career has always been related to service, service to others. Uh, the career prior to this, the paid one, actually somebody wrote a check for me. I was a waste, fraud, and abuse investigator for the Office of the New York State Medicaid Inspector General. And my job was to find naughty practitioners who were helping themselves to narcotics in healthcare and knowing what rocks to look underneath and how to capture these people. Um, and then we would kind of hand them off to law enforcement and then they go to jail. It's a bad thing. Cause I was really good at finding evidence. You know, I'd get those people out of the thing. So I have a really strong healthcare background and all my years with Red Cross. And I am a professional facilitator, so I hope this evening you will enjoy our discussion because it's not really a presentation. I'm facilitating you through some information that you'll understand about the Red Cross. Um, I apologize, the clicker here doesn't work tonight, so I'll just kind of run back and forth. First, I want to talk about what the Red Cross is, who we are. We are the largest humanitarian organization on this planet. Don't know what that's going to be in the future. There may be other planets involved, but right now, we're the number one. We were founded in May of 1881, right here in western New York State, down in Dansville. Anybody of you are from Rochester in this area? You're familiar with Dansville? There are Claire Barton houses there. It is open to the public. It's a museum. It's a great way if you're interested in American history, especially around the time of 1881, Claire Barton and all that piece, it's open and it's free and it's kind of a cool place. 
In 1900, the Red Cross was issued their first congressional charter by the United States government, and that is to alleviate human suffering through assistance in disasters and services to the armed forces. We're still doing that to this day exactly as that charter has been modified and, and rewritten many, many times, but that charter is still in existence. We're an organization that is funded 100% by donations. We're a 503C company, so we're a nonprofit. And 91 cents of every donated dollar goes back to the clients that we serve. So only nine cents out of every dollar pays for all of the support, the staff, the offices, the facilities, my salary, there's very few of us. 91% of our people, as well, actually it's 93% of our people, not just 91, are volunteers that do all of the work that Red Cross does in all of the different categories. There's many arms of the Red Cross. There's the International Red Cross, there's the Red Crescent. They're all part of the Red Cross organization, but tonight we're gonna to focus on the American Red Cross and what we do specifically about disaster services. So the mission of the organization is to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergent sites, using the power, the massive power of volunteers. That's very unique in the industry. If you think about you folks, what you do, you are all, I'm assuming, going to be social workers or case workers or crisis workers at some point. So I'd like to just for a minute go around and introduce yourself. Tell me your first name because I won't remember your last name by any means. Tell me what your intended career is when you graduate, what you want to do. Like, okay, I'm doing this for fun, but I really want to be a fork truck operator. That's great. Let me know that because we'll talk about that later on. But we'll just start with you. Um, my name is Jill, um, <coughs> and I want to be a counselor. Okay, what kind of counselor? I'm not sure yet. I'd like to work with you. You? Okay, great. Excellent. Um, I'm saying that I want to be a school counselor. School counselor. I'll hook you up with my daughter. She teaches an 811 program at Home Road School. We had to arrest him with a child yesterday. It was great. Because he decided to upload one of the buildings. It was great. I assume um, I'm going to be a college counselor. College counselor. I'm going to come back and help these people. I can't get through it. Good. My name is Sabrina. Um, I would like to be a mental health counselor. I would also like to be a park ranger. Park ranger. Very cool. Very, very cool. Now it's going to be a choice. Which way does the thing go? Both of them. That's cool. I am Asia. I'm uh, aspiring to be a school counselor. Okay. What, what people? College? Elementary? High school? Uh, middle school. Middle school. Oh, oh, oh. you got your <laughs> Yeah, you'll rethink that later on. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alicia. I'm also school counseling, and middle school is my track. Okay. Hi, I'm Shaina. I want to do college counseling. I'm sorry, you said Shaina? Yeah. Okay. I'm Colette. Um, I don't know what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Currently, I'm a college professor. Oh, okay. What so do you counselors. teach? What do you teach? Counseling. Counseling. Wow, that's pretty cool. I like that. Okay. So, do you find volunteers in the counseling industry? Just think of the whole industry. You guys are graduate students, right? Do you find volunteers in the crisis counseling industry or in the counseling at all? Very unique, right? You don't. The Red Cross, our volunteers do that. They're the ones that take care of those things for us. So we'll talk about that and how this all fits in. Because you're going to find, while well, you're thinking like, disaster, I don't want to do college kids, I'm elementary, it's not going to fit. You're going to find that this fits very nicely with what you have in your career path. Whether you want to drive a pork truck, maybe, or you want to do counseling, which you're spending all this money to do. We do this through the amazing generosity of our donor. It is a huge process to do that donation service and to get those in, but that's how our organization has been funded from the very beginning. So what do we do with our volunteers and those generous donors? We provide shelter, feeding, and comfort to people that are affected by disasters in the United States. We supply nearly, actually a little over half of the American blood supply through our blood program blood and biomedical products. We teach life-saving skills. How many of you have had a first aid, a CPR, a water safety, a babysitting class? 
And if you haven't had one of those, raise your hand because you're getting some training tonight and you're about to start that path as well. So you are touched by Red Cross in some way in your life. We help military families, the military and their families. We are the designated agency. So how many of you have somebody in the military that you know or care about? Okay, a couple of you. So if you were to get them an emergency message, how would you tell them that grandma's sick and in the hospital or so and somebody's having a baby? You'd call the 1-800 Red Cross number that's dedicated to this 24 hours a day. They would take that information from you. A caseworker would then validate that information with a third party, hospital, funeral home, whatever. And then transmit that information through the Pentagon, through our desk at the Pentagon, to that service member in the field within 24 hours. Usually it's a lot less, but if they're in a clandestine area, or they're in the field and unreachable, I don't know, maybe they're in combat, not going to roll out a little cell phone, hey, stop shooting, call us back. We're going to get that message to them, and we're going to get them home. It's a unique service we do, and it is one of the few things that we are doing in a similar way that Claire Barton envisioned back in 1881. And we provide humanitarian services worldwide, vaccinations, helping with water treatment, a huge amount of things. How many of you remember the um, subway, uh, was it subway, or the, the most recent disaster they had in France was a mass shooting, seeing it on the news? Did you notice all the people with the vest with the Red Cross on the back? Those were our Red Cross volunteers in France who were disaster mental health counselors. We were first on the scene. We were first on the scene in Miami for the shooting there. We've been all of the shootings, the massacre shootings in the United States, around the globe, actually. We have humanitarian workers everywhere. And if you start thinking about and watching the news, you will see either the Red Crescent or the Red Cross just about every night somewhere doing something on the globe. So we're in a very, very powerful and large organization, and we do a lot of great things providing hope for people. So we'll focus more about the United States. So this is obviously a map of the United States and our tributaries and other areas. We're divided into something called divisions. Divisions are large sections, so we'll sort of focus on our kind of neck of the woods here. We're in the Northeast Division the New York State. That's New Jersey, New York, and all the way up through Maine. The largest division is what they call SWARM, it's an acronym. It's kind of this area here. It's a really big space. It's about the command and control of how that's laid out. Within those divisions, there are regions. Regions are smaller. We're in the Western Sun Generic region, which is this little purple or pink part of New York State. And again, a smaller command and control region. And then within there, we have chapters. We're in the Greater Rochester chapter. We are the second chapter of the American Red Cross. We were created six weeks later after Clara Barton opened the first one in Danceville. So we've been doing a Red Cross about 100 years longer than I've been around. Some people think I was around when the beginning, as a don't know that. We have three counties, Monroe, Livingston, and Ontario. And that's our footprint that we take care of. But as a staff member for the Red Cross, I cover all 26 counties for different things. One of my roles primarily is training. I'm a master advanced to some other, a variety of other jobs, but that's my primary one, a lot of what I do. But we do it the same way, whether we're here in Rochester or we're over here in Guam, Red Cross is done the same way throughout the United States. It's a very consistent process. Just as you might treat a client the same way, whether you're treating this client or that client, they still get that same sort of intake, they get that same sort of referral process, might be a different referral, but it's very similar. We have a very conscientious, straightforward approach, and we do that as well. Which brings us now, we're going to start focusing in more and more on the disaster piece of it. So now you know what we are. You know where we are, besides being here tonight. You know that what are basics that we do, and we're going to start again focusing on disaster. Now, Red Cross is very tied 
We are separate organizations. We follow our own rules and our own pieces, but with FEMA. You've heard of FEMA, right? Federal Emergency Management Agency. Probably some good and some bad, and that's okay. We integrate them with them so closely sometimes that we appear to be, to many people, one organization. Because we follow the same disaster cycle. We have a prepare, a respond, and recover, and they do that same piece. That's how they get their job done. The nice part is because we're so integrated with FEMA, that moves down through all of the other things. So FEMA has a whole bunch of classes, if you weren't familiar with this, on disaster mental health crisis management. And they're all free if you do the online ones. There's actually, I think it's 1,600 courses that FEMA has. You can, if you want to pay the price, you can get a master's or a PhD from the, uh, the University of Maryland, I believe it is, that, made, that runs that for FEMA. And most of it's online, which is a really well go classes. So it's there for you. You can sign up for free and take as many as you want until your brain explodes. And then you're like, what? Why did I do this? But we're going to go through these cycles and explain how Red Cross fits into that. So you're comfortable with that. So as you get to the next piece, the online learning piece, you kind of know what's going on. So we're going to break this down. First word we're going to talk about is prepare. So one of the first things we have to have is a trained workforce. So you couldn't do your job as a counselor without proper training, proper certification. The same holds true for our disaster workforce. A fire department isn't going to let their firefighters play with the fire hoses and the ladders and drive the trucks unless they're properly trained. No organization is going to let their people go into harm's way, or not, unless they're properly trained. And we're the same way. As with the Marine Corps, everybody who joins the Marine Corps is a rifleman because at the base of their organization, that's what they do. They protect the American public. Our job is to provide disaster assistance, so every one of our volunteers who's in disaster services starts off with sheltering and feeding training. Because you may go and be deployed to a disaster situation, maybe it's here in Rochester. And let's just for say that we have um, good example. A Ghana nuclear power plant emergency it decides to let a little gas out. It's not good gas because it's contaminated with gamma radiation and that tends to be really bad. So guess what? School's closed at Brockport and you guys are going to become an emergency shelter here because you've got a lot of space. You may think, oh, I'm going to go and do crisis counseling, but when you have 6,000 people coming your way, one of the most important things we need first is cots set up. We need to register people. We need to feed them because they're hungry, they're tired, they're thirsty. So everybody learn sheltering and feed because you may have to go back and rely on those skills. Beyond that, there's lots and lots of things to learn within Red Cross. Our entire learning management system is essentially open to you after tonight once we get you in that system. Some of the classes do have prerequisites. Not a problem. They're pretty easy to understand. You might have to take a class before you take the next class because we do knowledge building. We start with you have the basics of the building, the infrastructure, and then from that you build the walls and then you build the roof and then you put in the carpeting and the walls and the paint to get to that advanced level. So you start out basic and move to advanced. Along with that, we get you field experience. We'll talk about the levels of that field experience in a little bit. But just in your job, you don't become a crisis counselor just by taking the classes. You have to get the field experience. You have to go out and do it. We make sure that our volunteers get that field experience. It's part of their growth process from a new volunteer to somebody who's a supervisor level and maybe a manager level and beyond. No different than your training. There's basic, immediate, and advanced. Questions any so far? Am I keeping you engaged? Can I talk slower if I want? I can talk a lot slower if you'd like. So the next part of our preparedness is the pillowcase project. How many of you said you wanted to work with the seven, eight, nine, and 10-year-olds? 
group. A couple of you wanted to do, or middle school, you know, sorry, you said middle school, right? So this project, this preparedness piece, kind of fits in with something you may be interested in. It's a free preparedness program. It's 8 to 11-year-olds. And it's for children. It's sponsored by Disney. I have to say that. It's the trade piece of this. They actually pay for the whole program for us. They donate the whole piece, all the materials, the books, and everything. But it focuses on three things. Home fire safety, disaster preparedness, and coping with crisis. We do that through talking home fire safety, you know, when your smoke alarm goes off, how long do you have to get out? Anybody know? How many say three minutes? Three minutes? Okay, you're gone, you're done. How many say uh, two and a half minutes? How many say two minutes? Let me see, okay, you'll be safe. How many say a minute? A minute? So if you get out in 120 seconds or less, you have enough time to escape the house before the smoke or the fire may overwhelm you. We teach the kids that. We talk about when they go out, where is their safe place. So how many of you have children at home? Perfect. Do your children know where the safe place to go is if your smoke alarm goes off in the house? Hmm. So when it does go off, you might be running around looking for them, like my wife and I were with our house fire when my daughter was seven. She knew the safe place to go, but she thought it was the tree at the neighbor's house, not at our house. And so while the fire departments were blocking the scene, she was over there standing next to Laura and Michael, going, wow, look all those fire trucks are behind it. <laughs> and my wife and I were in a total panic because we didn't know where Emily was. No. Fire department there and they're diving for smoke, looking for this little eight-year-old, looking under the beds in the closets. All of a sudden, Laura and Mike walk over and say, We got Emily. And so it's that safe place that's really important. And we really focus on that with these kids. We talk about being prepared. So where this all started was, and this is where we get into the pillowcase piece of it, during Hurricane Katrina, there were all these college kids that were evacuated from their dorms. And they had to have a place to go, so they went to a shelter. So what do college kids usually have easily readily available? Pillowcase. Usually like five or six of them because they got all the pillows lined up. So they emptied out the pillows and they threw the stuff they needed in the pillowcases. Toothbrush, their digital media players, all that stuff that they really didn't need but they thought they did. And they jammed it all in that pillowcase and they went to the Red Cross shelter. And our program manager who was in that area in Texas at the time saw that as an opportunity to teach kids of making a go kit. And so the pillowcase project was born, and the kids get a pillowcase, a white pillowcase. I didn't bring one, I'm sorry. My plans got changed today. I had to go out and teach at high school. But it's a pillowcase that they decorate with felt markers, fabric markers, and it already has outlines of things that you put in a disaster kit. So what might you put in your disaster kit? Water. Toothbrush. Toothbrush. Medications. Medications. Soap. Soap. What'd you put? I was thinking water and food. Water and food, okay. What can't you live without? Think about that. Glasses. Glasses. Eyeglasses, yeah. I'd be bumping into things. What would you bring? I don't know what's left. All kinds um, of stuff. I guess first aid stuff. First aid stuff, okay. Snacks. Snacks. She took mine on with it so, first aid, but extra clothes. Clothes, that's good. Sucks to be naked, right? <laughs> how about your phone? How many of you would bring a phone? Yeah, how many of you are going to remember to bring your charger? <laughs> how many of you, if you had to think about it and had to run out of your house right now, knew exactly where your charger was? Yep. Yeah. So what happens when your phone goes dead, right? So we talk about all these things with these kids. 8 to 11 years, we talk about them. And trust me, they get it. They're really good at thinking about this stuff. And then we get into something called coping skills, and we do something called breathing through color. Have any of you heard of that? It's really easy. You want to try it? It takes one minute. So close your eyes. 
Think of your favorite color. Don't say it out loud. Keep it in your head. By the way, this is terribly hard for that age group to do. Now think of the color you hate the most. Okay. Now I'd like you to do a nice slow breath in and think of the good color. And exhale the bad. You can take two or three breaths. And as you notice, you sit there thinking about the good and the bad. How your body starts to relax. You feel calm. It's a program we do with these children. We spend probably five or ten minutes doing it with them. Because we're only there for about 45 minutes, maybe an hour at most. And we've taught them how to get out of the house, have fire drills, have a safe place to go, to get out. Not to take things, just get out. How to be prepared, how to build that go kick, and how to cope with the stress of a disaster. Because it is no stress that you've ever felt before when you lose all your stuff. Especially if there's a fatality involved. Whether it's a human or a pet, it can be just as overwhelming to that small person. And so we teach them these skills. And here's a really neat part. When I was deployed to Oklahoma for the tornadoes that wiped out more Oklahoma in that elementary school, I was there as the, the training manager for that job, that disaster relief operation. I had to go to one of the shelters to do some just-in-time training with some supervisor on writing job evaluations. And so in between classes, I would walk around the shelter and try and help any way I could, because I'm trained in lot, the whole gamut of things. And I came across a little boy sitting on one of our Red Cross cots next to his dad. And his dad is weeping, I would say almost uncontrollably. And this little, I'm going to say he was about 10, maybe 11, if that, rubbing his dad's back, trying to soothe his dad. And what was he talking about? Breathing through color. And what's underneath his cot? One of our pillowcases that he took the program with and decorated. You know it works. We can, we've seen it, how well it works with these children. It is an amazing, amazing program. And it's absolutely free. They get a nice workbook, a really nice <coughs> color workbook, and this pillowcase, totally free. They decorate it. They can take it home. They learn, they share, and they practice. And those are the three elements of that program. And it works extremely well. Something that all of you could become trained with to present somewhere in the community to that age group of children. It could be at a faith-based, it could be at elementary school, it could be Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, you name the program. All they have to be is 8 to 11 year olds, and they want to be interested in taking it. And you've got to have them for an hour. So if you're interested in that, you'll have my contact information, you can reach back. Okay, New York State Citizen Preparedness, a little more boring. This one's designed for adults. So after Hurricane Sandy, New York State realized that we weren't really well prepared for disaster. We weren't. I mean, look at the mess that Sandy caused. I mean, not just us, the whole East Coast. So they came up with this New York State prepared, Citizen Preparedness Training Corps. And it's really a program that Red Cross, along with New York State Guard, delivers to the New York State citizens about being prepared, having tools and resources that they develop and build in their own, to be prepared so they're more resilient for disasters. Because people that are trained recover much faster. There's lots and lots of papers on that. To recover it very quickly from disaster, to that pre-disaster condition. We deliver it absolutely free. It's about 45 minutes long, if you're interested in delivering that, being really good about knowing about preparedness. It's a slide deck. New York State produces it. We just talk about it, deliver it, shake hands, answer questions, and send them on their way. But it does make a difference, and they just have to be 13, 14 years old and up to take that program. So again, more preparedness. Our last program, and one I'm the most proud about, is our Sound Alarm Save a Life. This program is to reduce deaths and injuries from home fires by 25% over the life of the campaign. We've already exceeded that when the campaign started in 2014. We have already reduced deaths by 416 lives because we've installed free smoke alarms in people's homes. Just in Monroe County, we have, I think it's six lives, 
and we have 20, we have 14 or 15 within our 26 county region, Western Central New York region. Live save because the smoke alarms we've installed in their homes. So how many of you have working, working smoke alarms? Good. How many of you have tested the batteries in the last six months? Okay. Those of you that have children, have you had a fire drill with your kids? They had one at school, but did you have one at home? Right? Just as important that they know how to get out. Because you probably love your kids. Well, I'm sort of doubting that as my 27-year-old, but you know, you know. A lot of lives saved. Now we're in the process of our national event. We've just completed it this, we have actually this, this coming Saturday is our last day of the event. We have installed so far, since 2014, we have made 544,000 households safer. Meaning we have talked about a home fire escape plan and a safe rescue point. Where they're going to go, what they're going to do, changing the batteries. We've installed over a million three hundred thousand smoke alarms <coughs> in people's homes. We don't just hand them smoke alarms, we actually install them. Through our youth programs, pillowcase is part of this sound the alarm thing. Over a million kids have been touched through that campaign of the uh, pillowcase. A million kids. It's a lot of pillowcases. It's more than the entire hotel industry in the United States probably has sitting in the closet right now. It's a lot of pillowcases. And while we're there doing smoke alarms, if they have working ones that are less than 10 years old, we'll replace the batteries, and that's almost 60,000 batteries. It's a lot of work. That preparedness piece. Honestly, if I could just do preparedness and not have disasters and never have another house fire that I respond to, that would be my job right there for the rest of my life. I'd be very satisfied. Never a dunder loss of life, never a loss of grandma's picture and their diamond ring that was a treasured piece or a pet or a family member. Just by doing this preparedness. It is a huge thing to be able to save lives in that way. So questions so far? Anybody need a break? I'm going to take a break, take a drink, if that's okay. Response. So there's some principles of disaster response. These are tough to understand when you're the one impacted by the disaster. Individuals are ultimately responsible for their own recovery. There is nothing other than insurance that's going to make you whole after you've been impacted by a disaster whether it's a large community disaster or a single family fire, that's it. So if you don't have insurance, if you're in that category and you have a disaster, a fire, you're not going to get back to the pre-disaster condition for a very long time. In some things, never. Especially if you've lost everything in that fire. So think of all the valuable things where you live. Can you live without all of them? And when you think about that, you're like, wow, that's a tough thought. So as a crisis person, are you ready to help somebody get through that? So you might be a school counselor. You might be drug and alcohol counselor. You might be a job counselor. You're going to deal with this crisis regardless of where you are in that industry. You're a counselor. That's what people are looking for your help from. And so this is where it starts to get a little personal for you. Because yes, it could be you impacted. And there's nothing wrong with having those same feelings, whether it's you or them. But being able to think them, get them through this process. Our assistance that Red Cross provides, and actually really it's all of the disaster agencies, is based on a verified disaster cause need. Many times we have a house fire, and the people next door will say, oh, they heard they got some money for replacing their clothing and their food and a place to hotel to sleep in. Can I get some money too? I live next door. 
I had to leave while the fire department was putting out the fire. Does that count? It's not a disaster caused me, so sadly, no. But that's not the end of how we can help. We have more. There's always more. Kind of like the sound on Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Just come today and you can buy the car because there's always more that we have. We want to provide a very consistent and uniform response. So whether you have a fire or a disaster here in Rochester or California or Maine or Michigan or Puerto Rico, you're going to get the same consistent uniform response from Red Cross. It's always the same, again, based on disaster cause needs. And we do not duplicate services that another agency is able to do because that just diminishes both of our ability to solve that client's problem. It's very similar in counseling. If they're getting a service from somebody else, do they need it from you? Probably not. You don't want to work against each other, and neither do we in that same way. Does it make sense? So when a fire, a disaster first occurs, the first group of people that go out for Red Cross is our disaster action team. There are a group of volunteers that are trained. There's a team leader, some members and trainees, or maybe team leader and all members, or a team leader and all trainees. It depends on the shift, but they're always on call, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. We never close at the Red Cross. They're the first responders when there is a disaster in our community. The largest or number one disaster the Red Cross sees is single family fires. Here in the greater Rochester are three counties. That's about every, a fire every day and a quarter to a day and a half. A family loses their stuff. That's a lot. If we go to Buffalo, it's about two and a quarter fires a day. If we go to Syracuse, it's about one and eighth in our region. Then there's Binghamton, they're the next behind that, and then there's the Corning, the Finger Lakes chapter, and there are five, four counties, excuse me, six counties, and uh, they're even less than that. If you want to pick a really safe county to live in the Rochester area, it's Livingston County. They only have about 10 to 12 fires a year. But there's more cows than people there, so cows don't start fires, they just end up in tornadoes, so we don't do that. We're there to provide immediate disaster assistance, emergency assistance, what they need to get them through the next 24 hours to 48 hours. So you've got weekends and they're in holidays, that kind of thing. But it's for those affected by the disaster. They happen day, they happen night times. We had a gentleman years ago from Kodak who was a statistician who said, I want to figure out when we should staff people the most. And he looked at like 20 years of fire dates and times. Guess what he found out? It's as random as flipping a coin of when they occur. But there are three things in my 37, 38 years that cause disasters. Mother Nature, tornadoes, hurricanes, forest fires, volcanoes, fate, and you're in the wrong place at the right time. So you leave the food cooking on the stove and then you go to the airport to pick up your family. Likely you're gonna come back to a toasted kitchen or a burnt down house. Or kids are playing the camps, or kids come home from college, and that's we always see a little influx in that, especially during the winter season. Because you're like, oh, I had those cool candles in my dorm room, I'm going to do those at home by the curtains and <laughs> gone. So our disaster action teams primarily respond to single family fires. That's the largest number of disasters we see. Sometimes they're double family or larger fires. We had one a second, a two alarm fire at um, St. Paul Street last week on Thursday that was two floors of a large apartment building. So we went up with a lot of cases really quick. Of course, natural disasters, fires, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes. I wanted to write volcanoes in there the other day. I just forgot to do it. Put a little volcano spurting out. But. Civil disturbances, that includes mass care shootings, mass casualty disasters, which is a big piece of that. Transportation accidents, we're not talking car versus car. We're talking plane versus ground. Greyhound bus versus bridge embutment. The one in um, where all those hockey players were killed. Our disaster mental health teams were working with those families that night. They were deployed there. And then large scale, larger scale community disasters, which could be all kinds of things. 
let your imagination run wild. We'll benefit. Very nice one. So, you're on the DAT team. You're my DAT team. Got a really big DAT team, you need a really big bus to get out there. But we'll do it. A fire breaks out. I don't know where. Red Cross receives notification directly from the 911 center. In Rochester, we have a great relationship with Monroe County. They call us as soon as the fire department declares it a working residential fire. We're the third call they make. The first one is the water authority to turn the pressure up so they can fight the fire. The second one is to Rochester Gas and Electric so they can go shut off the power to that building so nobody gets electrocuted. And the third one is the Red Cross so we can get out of the way to respond. We don't respond red lights and sirens. We just respond like every other person on a normal vehicle. On the streets, we obey all those traffic laws. So we get there within about two hours. Usually in Rochester, it's about 30 minutes, but it could be bad weather, it could be longer. So our team is then deployed. We've been answering service at night, weekends, during the day, our office answers it and deploys those volunteers that are on call. The team responds to the incident and they talk to the incident manager. Typically, it's the fire chief. Where are the clients? Oh, it's these two ladies right here. So you're distraught. You're crying. You're looking at your house going to the ashes to burn. They're squirting water and everything. It's getting wet. They're shoveling your stuff outside because they're starting to do the damage cleanup. We need to sit down and interview you. Can you imagine how difficult that is with somebody that is that distraught? But our teams are really good in doing that because they receive a lot of training. Based on your interview, we will determine what your immediate disaster cause needs are. They can be a lot of different things, and we'll talk about those in a minute in detail of what they are because that affects you as a crisis worker or counselor. After we give them the immediate assistance, our caseworkers in the office, again, volunteers, are going to work on a recovery plan with those clients, with that family, an individual recovery plan. What do they need to do to get whole? Do they need to call their insurance? Do they need to talk to their landlord? Do they need to find temporary or permanent housing? Do they need to visit the family member who's in the burn ward or in the trauma center? Do they need to find a locksmith who's going to get the new car keys because their car keys just burnt up in the house? Or it's such a mess in there now because the fire department was in there having a good old time. They can't find it. Out. So lots of different kinds of things, and our caseworkers spend somewhere between 30 and 60 days working with that family, sometimes every day, sometimes five or six times during the day. On the phone, usually sometimes they come in, so that we can work with them and develop and help them through that individual recovery plan. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that something you, as a caseworker or a counselor, could do? Could you do that? Helping somebody navigate that process? Absolutely. So while you might be a counselor for that, you can also be a caseworker. So it, it fits very nicely. So again, at the scene, we're going to do an interview, we're going to determine their needs. We're going to make sure that they have money for food, clothing, and comfort items. We're actually going to give them a client assistance kit, which is a little bag, it's got a toothbrush, toothpaste, bar soap, washcloth, shampoo, deodorant, all that kind of stuff in it. We're going to give each family member one of those. We're going to determine if their home is livable or unlivable. Livable means you can't go back even after 48 hours of working on it. If you can get back in your home within less than 48 hours, maybe the electricians need to show up, get the power back on, or plumbing, or put a tarp on the roof, or whatever, then your home is livable, and that helps us determine how much money we're going to give you, because they're two different values. Our health services nurse is going to be involved. Again, a volunteer. She's going to help them with medication replacement. So if any of you uh, take medication and tried to get a refill earlier than you were allowed, what do they tell you? I can't do it. So what happens when, if you don't have our nurse and you call the pharmacy the next day and say, hey, my medication burned up. 
I was taking, oh, I don't know, I was taking um, drugs for my diabetes uh, neuropathy. Now I'm in a lot of pain. How can you help me through this? The pharmacy won't refill my prescription. What do I do? Well, the amazing thing is our nurses have the ability to bypass all that and get them refilled. Not only do we do that, but we can help pay for up to $500 per person in client assistance money to pay for those copays. So we can help them get those meds. Now, a lot of times it's not that night. No pharmacy except for one in Rockland, maybe two now, is open 24 hours, and I'm willing to bet that person doesn't have their scripts there. So it has to be the next business day, but still, we'll help them through it. That includes durable medical items like eyeglasses, dentures, all kinds of things, cranes, crutches, walkers, CPAP machines, there's a whole long list of that stuff. Our nurses will help them do that, and the unique part is, you've all heard of HIPAA, right? We're exempt from it by federal law. We are the only agency in the United States exempt from HIPAA because of disaster use. Just kind of neat. Actually, you have that little cool letter from the director of the Healthcare Information Portability Act. It says, yeah, Red Cross doesn't need to, you can share information with them, but we still have the consent, which allows us to do that as well. But so it helps us get through that red tape, which is kind of nice. And then we have mental health. And we have mental health folks. The only requirement from Red Cross are for our disaster mental health is that they have a license to practice independently in a state within the United States. So it could be a lot of different things, LCMSW, L uh, counselors, school counselors, psychiatrists, psychologists, there's a whole long list, nurses with psychiatric uh, privileges, a long list. But we also refer them to those crisis counselors and our lead here, and I'm trying to get him in to come and talk with you guys or at least reach out to you for questions, is Peter Roach. And he is our disaster mental health lead. We also have Tara Hughes, who is uh, internationally recognized in child counseling and crisis. And she's played quite frequently nationally for that. She's in our Buffalo, works out of our Buffalo office. And her practice, I believe, is crisis or counseling related to uh, sex trafficking for children. So a very, very specialized piece of that. But all the same, those people are there supporting those clients especially if there's any fatalities involved or injuries to another family member because those add a whole new layer of stress on top of this whole mess. So questions about any of this so far? Good. So the fire happens the next day, they go to the hotel. They may have slept through the night, doubtful. They're pretty wired. There's a lot on their minds. Our caseworkers are going to assist that family with developing a recovery plan. That could be all kinds of things, essential items, but for the first week or so, they're living in a hotel. Maybe they received public assistance and now they're on the road looking for a new public assistance housing in the community working with social services. But helping them with those things, because it's a lot of work. They don't know what to do. If you had to start looking, you can't just Google it. I need a new bed because mine burnt. You won't find it. But our caseworkers are specialists in that. Our health and mental health folks are going to continue to support their needs. Because it's a big piece of what they need. And those nurses sometimes are on the phone a couple of times, helping them understand the, where they need to go to get where they need to be. Helping them with that path. Navigating insurance. You guys like navigating insurance? Your car insurance, your rental insurance, your homeowner's insurance? Just think, you haven't had a crisis and you hate doing it? Can you imagine what these folks are going through? Getting hold of their landlord. I mean, I don't have a crisis and I have a problem getting hold of my landlord. I don't want to be fired, it would be a mess. And then referrals. A huge, huge number of referrals. Everything you can think of, mental health counseling, health services, new beds, new clothing, new toys for your kids. Are you familiar with the Pirate Toy Fund here in Rochester? We're part of the Pirate Toy Fund. Every child who experiences a fire gets a bag of toys the next week. 
in the Christmas holiday week, I'll just call it, they get toys that night. We carry them with us. Big garbage bags of toys, age appropriate, in groups. We give those kids toys, five, six, seven things each. Again, it's part of that recovery process. I don't care whether you're two or you're 22, it's nice to get something when you've lost everything. <coughs> so those referrals are huge. We work with a huge number of agencies, both government and non-governmental, not-for-profit, faith-based, you name it, a huge book of referrals. Plus, you're all familiar with this number called 211. They have even more. So what I would encourage you is to go to the 211 website for your community. Here in Rochester, it's the Finger Lakes 211. And look at some of the referral partners that are there. And I don't know whether you want to make yourself a little free reminder, or you want to use OneNote and put them all in nice tab sheets or make a spreadsheet, whatever you want to do. But start building your referral list now. Get to know those agencies. Go down there and visit them. Talk to somebody who is like you, a crisis counselor or a nurse or a caseworker. And develop that relationship now. Because when I know them, and I can say, hey, Sid, let's work. We have a client together that has a problem. We can do that because we know each other. We already know each other, do what we do, who we work for, and the clients that we serve, and bang, takes care of it. And you will be a rock star in your industry doing that. But these referrals are an enormous piece of your world and ours as well. Okay, so bad things happen on larger scales. Hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanoes, floods. Huge bad things. By the way, this was the tornadoes in Oklahoma. I didn't take that picture, a friend of mine did. But that's what more Oklahoma looked like, and that's actually the hospital that's behind it that had half of the hospital ripped away. Big mess. So, huge flooding. That's uh, Houston this past year. How would you like to live in one of those homes? Can you imagine the stress that that family is going through when they know they've got that to go home to? So now that you're thinking about where these are, let's talk about what Red Cross does. We have this thing called the GAP chart, Group Activity and Position. Now you're probably thinking GAP, that's place at the mall, but I get flip-flops and capris, cool summer stuff. Ours is our Group Activity and Position. And there are 57 different activities here that get activated when we have a large-scale disaster. They're all in families, and we're going to break these families apart, but I wanted you to see the chart. Because there's a lot of stuff on here. We have mass care, individual disaster care, recovery, logistics, which are all these two columns, information and planning, external relations, and finance, because somebody's got to pay for this whole mess. Because it costs money to get volunteers there during a disaster. It costs money to help these clients get what they need. So we'll break this apart a little bit. First of all, you need to understand that there are three levels for each of those positions. So while there's 57 different jobs, each one of those jobs has three levels. Everybody starts off as a service associate. That's the base of our workforce. It's the largest piece. Those are the people who can work with the clients on their day-to-day -day problems getting them where they need to go based on that specific position they're working on. For about every five to seven service associates, we have a supervisor. That supervisor has more knowledge, more training, especially training with working with volunteers and supervising them. And then you have enough cases like me who are up at the manager piece, and then we even go higher than that. We go ADs, which are assistant directors, and chiefs, and all the way up. But we're working to get you at this level now for sheltering, feeding, and potentially disaster mental health. So that when you do get your license, you're going to be like, oh, I remember Bill. He was at the Red Cross. He gave us this great discussion. I'm excited. I want to do this. 
because I want to help people. Because I'm willing to guess none of you chose this occupation because it looked cool in the Brockport curriculum guide. You chose this for the same reason people volunteer with us, and that is you want to share your compassion to help somebody else. Am I right? So, um, goal is to get you to the green box. So, we talked at the beginning, everybody starts in mass care, sheltering and feeding. There's two kinds of shelters. You'll learn this in the training piece that we're going to let you do offline or online with us. We have evacuation shelters. That's when people need to go there quickly. There's a tornado coming. Where do you go? If you're here at school and there's a tornado alert, do you know where you're going? Out in the middle of the field and stand there going, take me now! No, you have to know where your safe evacuation place is. This is not a good room, by the way. You know why? Windows. Find an inside center of the building place, away from glass. Lower level. And then we have post-impact. Floods, hurricanes, winter storms. It's happened. Now I need a safe place to go for a while. Evacuation centers tend to be 24 hours or less. No cots or blankets. Post-impact, easy way to remember, is cots and blankets. Place for people to sleep. Then we have feeding, because when they're coming to stay with us, what happens? They get hungry, right? You've got to feed them. We do two ways. We have fixed feeding sites, like at the shelter, at a church where people come to us. And then we have mobile feeding that we do in an emergency response vehicle, where we go through the communities, we get out of the PA and say, we have hot food, cold water, come on over. People come over and we give them those things, right out of the, out the side of our vehicle. We have distribution of emergency supplies, rakes, shovels, brooms, cleanup kits, water, ice, dry ice. You have a lot of fun with dry ice at emergencies, by the way. Do you ever all the science shows you watch as a kid? The cool things you can do with dry ice? That's why I like dry ice at emergencies. Lots of fun things that we can give away, but they're all needed by these people. During the water crisis they had in Flint, Michigan, Red Cross was there, and all that we gave out was water and ice. The sucky part is when you got to carry that water up 20 or 30 floors to that family that can't get out because they're in a high rise. But our volunteers did that. They got that water and ice to them. And one of my favorite things to talk about is reunification. Reunification is one of the other things that Clara Barton did in the very beginning on the battlefield in 1881. She saw Henri Dunant, who started the idea of the Red Cross movement, it wasn't called the Red Cross then, to reunify people separated from their families. Back then they did it with carrier pigeons, I guess, I don't know. Today we do it electronically, and it works really well. It's called our safe and well system. Now there's many other organizations who have now duplicated that. Facebook does it, FEMA does it, there's some other ones. But basically it works like this. You're involved in a disaster. You have family that lives somewhere else, but all the cell towers are down and you can't communicate. So how do you reach them? How are you going to tell them you're safe? Could be very difficult, unless you happen to have a carrier picture. So we get you to register, and you can either go on one of our computers, because we bring in our own network, our own internet, our own computers and power. We set them up as workstations. Or we have these little index cards and you fill it out and you give it to a Red Cross worker and then it goes back to our site, our office area, it's set up and they load them for you. And you tell them your name, first and last name, your pre-disaster address and your pre-disaster phone number. And then you pick a choice of messages. For example, I'm safe and well and I'm in a shelter. I'm safe and well and I'll get to you soon. They always say safe and well, it's part of the name of the program. But so you do that and it gets in the system. So then your relative, I don't know, far away, doesn't where where they are on the globe, can go to, they're watching CNN or NBC or CBS, big disaster in Rochester, cell phones knocked out, thousands of people in shelters. And they're watching it on the news. And how do you think they feel? Your, your counselors, what do you think they feel? Give me some adjectives, some nouns, some ideas of how they feel. How would you feel? 
Strive. Angry. Why can't I reach them? Loss of hope. Despair. Tears. You name it. All of those feelings are going to go through. I can't get a hold of my loved one, my son, my daughter, my old friend, my friend from college. But what I grew up with, not a problem. Because along with that message is if you're looking for your relatives, go to safeandwell.org or redcross.org and click on safe and well. If you know the name of the person you're looking for and either their address and or that phone number, you can see that message that they populated, that you populated here in Rochester. And now you know that your loved one is okay. But we have more. Because remember I said there's always more on the Red Cross? So let's say that you go to that reunification site and the loved one you want is not listed. But the loved one you're looking for, I don't know, they have dementia, Alzheimer's, I don't know, they're cancer patients. I do name the problem. They didn't list themselves. You think there are people like that? Absolutely. So you can put in what's called a welfare inquiry. And our reunification volunteers, <coughs> excuse me, who are on the ground in that disaster area are going to check all of the possible, most likely, sources of where they may be. They're going to check all our shelters. That's really easy because we've got a system to do that. They're going to check all the morgues because our nurses are going to be working with those uh, clinicians at the morgues. We're going to check the police departments to make sure you weren't naughty and got in trouble and are now have this silver set of bracelets to wear behind you. We're going to check where your pre-disaster address is to make sure you're not sitting on your stoop wondering, where's my house? What happened? Where did everybody go? My car is over there upside down on the sidewalk. What's going on? Because the tornado just blew through, but they don't understand that. And so our worker is going to go help and find them. Now, when we do find them, most of the time we do, sometimes we don't. Because they just left the area. They don't know where they've gone. But they'll check with neighbors, and you know, they're really good at investigating this. They will give that information to the person they're looking for. They're not going to say, oh, yeah, we found him, because we don't know whether that person you're looking for is on the witness protection program, and you're in the mob. So just so you guys know, she's on the witness protection program. So we're not going to share that with anybody. See, you guys didn't know that about her. You, this mild-mannered professor who's been teaching classes happily all these years. You know her secret. But we don't want to let that out because that's not our responsibility to do that. But we will work through that process to get that person help. So one of the really cool things that Clara Barton envisioned we still do today, but now it's done electronically. For the people in Puerto Rico, by the way, any of you speak Spanish? Raise your hand if you speak Spanish. We should talk afterwards. Because we have the largest population of Puerto Rican evacuees of anywhere in New York State, including New York City, here in Rochester. And they need help. And if you're interested in working with that piece, I can directly connect you with the Avira American Action League because they are desperate for help right now. Absolutely desperate. So reunification was great in Puerto Rico because it's in all the different languages in the system, English, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, German, all that. So it works really well. Okay, disaster individual care. This is kind of your department where you guys fit in. It'll help. But we are there not just for our clients, but our workforce. Because I got news for you, if you're a disaster responder and you're at the Moore Elementary School and several hundred children have died along with a bunch of teachers, Trust me, it ripped my heart out to work there that day. I left that work site after three hours. I went back to headquarters. I walked over to the disaster mental health area. I sat down. My counselor's name is Sister May. She happened to be a nun as well as a, that's the zombies that are coming in. They heard disaster and they're kind of like, like a magnet. I needed crisis support. I'm a work person but I needed to be talked down a little bit off the wall so I could go back and do my job, and that's what they did. So our health services are there to make sure that our workforce is healthy and well. 
and they're there to help our clients replace medications and durable medical items and sadly they help with our care our integrated care and condolence team they will go to the family's houses where they have lost a loved one and make a visit and help them through that crisis so they are part of that ICCT but I, did, I leave out acronyms when I do that as much as I can mental health crisis support certainly and those integrated con condolence teams and then we have spiritual care Spiritual care is unique because at Red Cross, we don't discriminate. We don't care whether your political beliefs, your gender identity, your color of your skin, we don't really care anything about that. We'll help you as long as you were born human on this planet. You're eligible for assistance from Red Cross. So we don't get into one religion or another. We don't care whether you're Methodist, Protestant, Islamic, it doesn't really matter. You're there to talk about how God, your God, can fit into your life and get your faith-based peace to help you in your recovery. And so health services, mental health, and spiritual care are all part of that integrated care and condolence team, the ICCT. Huge, huge piece of what we do, especially think of places where there have been a lot of fatalities. Las Vegas, Miami, Columbine, the list gets bigger and bigger, and you all know how these shootings are going up and up and up. A big part of what we do is those condolence teams. People don't need sheltering, they need support. Again, we rely on volunteers like yourselves. Questions about any of those? Do you have a question or just get more? Okay. Logistics. The staff and stuff of what we do. So whenever we get there, we're getting there, there's nothing there. We have to get everything we bring with us. We have our staff, our staff services team. They're our travel agents. They get our staff to that disaster so they can help. All of our disasters work as a bullseye. That happens at ground zero right in the center, the dead center of the bullseye, that's where the disaster is. That first ring going out, that center ring, we use up all of our resources, our staff and stuff within there. And when we run out of resources, we go to the next ring, kind of like mutual aid in a fire department or a police department. Well, that mutual aid is a little farther out. Maybe it's the next county or the next state. And so our staff and services people get volunteers from the next ring out and bring them in. And then we burn up those resources and we use them up. Because we can't take everybody because we need people back home to take care of life, their kids, their jobs. And then we go to the next ring and next ring. And that just basically is a distance, a proximity to the disaster that we grab people and that's what their job is, planning and support. Now when our volunteers get there, we've got to have a place for them to stay. So we either have to set up, get hotels, or we set up staff shelters for just our volunteer workforce to stay in. We also get community, local community volunteers Sometimes it's called event-based volunteers, but honestly, it's people that live there who want to volunteer for a couple hours or a couple of days, but don't want to do this for the rest of their lives. They want to come help. They have a little time, they see the disaster, they feel the need to share their compassion, and they come and help. And we give them some on-the-job training, and they do some basic skills, like setting up pots or feeding, things like that. And then we have training. Logistics, that is the Excuse me, the biggest thing that we do. It is huge. Whenever there's a disaster, try and rent a rental car, I dare you. You won't find one. It's like every college, every high school is graduating at the same second in time in that area. Because the disaster response agency is not just Red Cross. Insurance companies and FEMA and all of those rent cars. So, huge piece of transportation. We also need facilities. We need warehouses. We need buildings for shelters. We need places for staff headquarters. We need places like this room for training. We need to buy stuff. Pads, paper, cots, food, toiletry items, health supplies. You name it, we buy it. Large supplies. Once we buy it, our supplier has got it stored in a warehouse. So we find an empty Walmart that's vacant or Sears and we turn it into a warehouse overnight. We have gifts in kind because people want to donate stuff. 
Because there's four ways to donate your stuff to the Red Cross. Your blood. How many of you are blood donors, by the way? Right? You're a blood donor? All right. Look at that. Two of them. That's great. You might donate your time. You might donate your money. Or you might donate your stuff. And so, for example, good example, um, International Paper Company. You guys are familiar with autism, probably, I'm guessing? Do autistic people work well in noisy environments? No, it's a total meltdown. So, International Paper has these really cool portable rooms. They're made out of cardboard. They're about yay high. They fit together like Lincoln Logs or Tinker Toys kind of things, real easy. And you make little portable quiet rooms for kids or parents or people. And so that's a donation that they do. They donate those to us. Uh, you might have Food Link donating water or food to the crisis to help out. All kinds of places do stuff. Um, Home Depot, one of our largest. Rakes, shovels, cleanup kits, buckets, bleach. Clorox usually donates bleach by the tractor trailer load to us for that. So lots of in-kind donations, but getting that stuff. And then life safety asset protection, that's kind of like the Red Cross safety cops, making sure that we're not doing stuff that's stupid and going to get a C in the nurse again. So that's their job. We have disaster technology. We are a technology-focused organization. Everything we do is technology-based. During a disaster, that stuff gets wiped out, so we have to bring in our own. So we start with an empty space and we bring in our own computers, our servers, our networking cables, printers, copiers, faxes, phones, everything. We bring in our own internet. We don't even tie into Time Warner or any of those places. We just bring our own because we know it's reliable and it works. And those folks do that. So that's our logistics. So the big L is everything. And this is, I tried to do a little L, just keep doing spell check on me. The little L of logistics, which is the stuff. Questions? Have I lost anybody? Do I need to go faster? Okay. Information and planning. Red Cross is the only agency that does this. FEMA relies on us for this, is damage assessment. Our volunteers will go house to house, street to street, community to community, neighborhood to neighborhood and determine whether each home is destroyed, has major damage, minor damage, is affected, unaffected, or inaccessible. We will populate all that data to a map using GIS. If you're not familiar with GIS, anybody not familiar with GIS? If you can get GIS, take it. It's the industry of the future, big money. They have good classes here at Brockport about that. Um, but we take and send that to the map which we then share with our government partners. We look at their infrastructure. We help them determine that. We take that information. So is the sewer working, the phone working, the roads open, all of that stuff. Because we need to know that stuff too so we can get our stuff where it's got to go and our staff. We look at the weather. Because if the weather's bad, I'm not going to send out my disaster volunteers if they're in danger themselves. Because I don't need more victims. Besides, the paperwork sucks when something happens. And then there's mapping, and mapping is now an enormous piece of Red Cross because that situational intelligence is massive. Because now we know that where the floodplain is and where our shelter is, and why would we put a shelter in the middle of a floodplain if it's raining? So we can look at that information and be very proactive about that, and we can use social economic data to determine where the most vulnerable population is, and so we base our resources on their needs way ahead of time. And then we have to get that information out to our volunteer workforce so they can help everybody. It's a long process. I'm a manager in situational information and information dissemination. So those are my two manager things. I like training the best, but I have to do multiple things. External relations as we get towards the end here. Community partnerships. We talked about a little bit with you guys that 2 one, one. But think of all of those other community agencies that might be able to help you. So you're counseling a middle school child who is getting abused. Who is your partner? CPS, right? So you have a partner. You've started one. But get to know their people, know their names, get their phone number, so that when you have a problem, you're not calling their 1-800 number. You can reach out to them. 
Now, I'm not a mandated reporter anymore in my job, but I have all of the numbers for the CPS people here in Monroe, Livingston, and Ontario County because I do have to work with them because our clients are impacted by them sometimes. We're involved in government operations. We have representatives at the local level, the state level, and the federal level all the time. We have a Red Cross paid staff member who sits in the Emergency Operations Center in Albany. It's called the Bunker. It's a scary place. It's down like three levels into the basement. The toilets flush up. Only place I've ever seen that in my life. But we have representatives there all the time. So at the state level, in Albany, he's there. At the people at the federal level, the Watch Center in Fairfax, Virginia, there is a Red Cross disaster volunteer there 24 hours a day. We chain them to the desk, they never leave. We bring in food once a week, but we're always at these levels because that's how we can respond. Having those partnerships together. Public affairs. Public affairs are really critical. When I do the training for volunteers, they, I always ask them, is it okay that we talk to a TV station? What do you think? What would your answer be? You say no, shake your head no, and that's okay. What do you think? Depends what they're saying is true. But we like the media. They're our best friends. You know why? Where does my funding come from? The public. If I don't inform the public of what we're up to, that we've opened 10 shelters, that we're helping a family from a single fire, if you watch the news, they interview the fire chief. Yes, chief, and tell me about the fire. Well, we extinguished it in 20 minutes. We had three companies involved and one firefighter was injured, but it's under control. What's the last statement? And Red Cross is helping the family. It's a small little piece, but our public affairs people, we notify them that we're there on the scene pretty quickly after we're there so that they can get that information out to all of the media sources. Now, whether they carry it or not, that's up to the media. But they're very important to what we do because that's how, every time one of those public affairs comes in, checks come in to support our mission. And again, that 91 cents goes back to those clients. And then there's just straight up fundraising. And those are the people that ask for big donations. $10,000, $200,000 checks. A very brief story. When I was in Louisiana last year, excuse me, in Florida for the hurricane, um, I was at one of the mega centers as a, a mass care manager. And it happened to be the Miami-Dade County Fairgrounds. And the gentleman who is the president of Humana Health, you've heard of Humana Health? One of the largest healthcare entities in the United States. He happened to make a million dollar donation to help the people of Miami, because that's where he lived. So he wanted to come in and he wanted to tour to see where his money was going. So they hooked him up with me. Okay. So we went on a little tour. Probably a half hour. And all I did was I told him what I tell any public affairs people, who I am, what we're doing, how we're helping the clients, and what, what, we, what our needs are. And we walked around for a half hour, and he said, you know, I, let's sit down and have a cup of coffee, Bill. I'd like to find out more about you. It was a ruse. He really didn't want to find more about me. He wanted a table and a pen so he could write down another half million dollar donation that day. Because I did my public affairs piece and my community partnerships piece by making that connection. I didn't share any client data with him. He could see their clients. He could see their needs. But I told our story. And that's a very powerful thing. Because you might be a crisis counselor. Or you might be a counselor to get them to figure out what they're going to do for college. Or how mom and dad are going to stop bugging them about their homework. Or how I get rid of my drug and alcohol problem. Or how I get through Brockport, SUNY Brockport, without getting my hair out. But you have to be able to tell your story. And even as a counselor, that's important. Because if you can't tell the story that you're doing... How's anybody going to know what you've been up to? You don't have to relay or share the confidential piece. 
but you have to be able to comfortably talk about what you're doing for the organization that you're serving. Well, it seems like a little minor piece. There's only really four things that you got to talk to the news crew about. Your name, because they're going to get it anyway. By the way, you have to spell it too, so they get it right. Don't ever not spell your name when you're in front of the camera. Because they'll spell it wrong, they always do. But you need to tell your story, what you're doing, how you're helping. I'm helping these children learn how to go to college. I'm helping these people get out of drugs and alcohol. Whatever it happens to be, telling your story is really important. And all of this ties together. Starting to see how it's starting to fit. How, while you think you're in this narrow field of counseling, what I'm doing, here's my world, here's my focus. It's bigger than that. Because all of these fit into that. Okay, recovery. Recovery is after a night of hard drinking, that's recovery. At Red Cross, it's assisting their clients with bridging the gaps of things they can't meet on their own. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's betting. Maybe it's medication. Maybe it's crisis support. Maybe it's what are we going to do when dad gets out of the hospital because he fell and broke his leg or he got burned or I. We work with the community leaders to help them get a strategy. So I think back to when lovely Warrens took office in January. Guess what happened a couple weeks later? Winter storm in Rochester. Ba boom! Power goes out. Darkness. She was in charge. She had no idea what to do. She has all these guys that follow her around. I call them her entourage. They're all in black suits that would drive a black car. It's like the Secret Service. But they take her around, but they don't know what to do. They rely on, they look to Red Cross. Bill, why do I do? What are we going to do? Well, lovely, here's what we should do. And so we work with them because we have that partnership with them. So you're doing school, and let's say that you have, God forbid, an active shooter. You take in that, run, hide, you fight, training. If you haven't yet, I really strongly encourage you to do that. If you have not watched that video, there's a lot of them on the internet, but it's run, hide, and fight. But you need to build up a relationship with the people you work around you so that when something happens, you can start your recovery strategy. How do we work with the children? How do we work with our clients? Maybe you're a counselor to group home. I have a coworker who used to do that. What was their strategy that they had for their recovery to get back to normal? Maybe a client passed away. That's actually what happened with her very suddenly. How did they get back to that? And that's the recovery strategy. And now she realizes that if she had had that, she would have been all set. But she didn't. So you guys are getting ahead of it. And we want to make sure that what we do aligns with government assistance, with FEMA assistance. So we're, again, we're not duplicating efforts because we don't want to diminish what one is doing or the other. We want to make sure that we're supporting these clients and the community the best way possible and not duplicating efforts. So questions about that purpose of recovery? I'm getting my steps into it. This is working good. So, social media. How many of you use social media? And if you don't raise your hand, you're lying. I know you all use social media. Am I right? Facebook, Twitter, Pine Tree, Apple Tree, whatever all those different ones are. I don't use a lot of social media, but I think that's fine. Red Cross was kind of unique in this world. We came up with a whole bunch of apps. They're free, whether you have Android or iOS. There's actually like 13 different apps. I only put a few on the board. Blood Donor, this is for our camera guy. We have a Blood Donor app. You can schedule your blood appointment, see how much blood you've donated, look at all that information. We have an earthquake app. We have a flood app. We have a uh, hurricane app. We have a tornado app. A little funny story about that. When I left Oklahoma, I had set the tornado app on my phone. 
So I'm in bed, it's like the next day, and I finally get some sleep in my own bed. My cell phone tends to sit on my nightstand because I'm normally on call 24 seven, that's part of my job. And about two o'clock in the morning, the next day or two, my phone goes I had left the tornado warning on for Oklahoma, but I wasn't in Kansas anymore, I was home. I rolled out of bed, screamed, ah! Forgot where I was, but it worked really well. It went off actually while I was there. I was in the hotel that night when the, 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 the third tornado that struck Chickasha, it was two and a half miles wide and it traveled for 16 miles long. It traveled about an eighth or a quarter mile away from my hotel. That was the only time in my 38 years that I actually wrote my social security number on my arm and my leg with a sharpie because I didn't know if I was going to make it. We try not to put people in harm's way, but sometimes Mother Nature has another plan. So these work really well. How many of you have pets? Cats, dogs, gerbils, hamsters, spiders, whatever, right? We have a pet first aid app. So when your pet, when Fluffy or Bow Wow gets in trouble, you can go, what do I do? And you go to your app and it'll tell you. We have the Forest Fire app. We have an emergency app, which is kind of all-encompassing. All of these apps, the emergency apps anyway, allow you to put in information about other loved ones. And so if these go off in their area, you get notified. So you can call grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, sister, brother, whatever, and say, hey, did you know a tornado, earthquake, whatever, well, earthquake, it's probably already happened, but there's going to be more, because there's always more in disaster, is going to happen and help get them to a safe place. So being prepared yourselves about knowing these kind of things. Did you know that roughly 60% of the people get their disaster preparedness information from social media now? So be like the rest of the world. Follow the leader. Download some apps. If you're only going to choose one, choose the emergency app because it encompasses all of these other disaster things. And it works really well. And it's very easy to use. Very, very easy to use. Okay, so now we get into the part where you have to do something, and that's Edge. Edge is our learning management system. It is a state-of-the-art product. That being said, everything that's state-of-the-art has bugs, right? This one has some bugs, and part of the bugs we'll talk about, and we'll talk about how to get you through that so you're not frustrated and yanking your hair out. Everybody gets trained at Red Cross, and you're in that process, so you're going to get trained too. We're going to start you with sheltering and feeding, because that's the basics of what we do. You know that now. The web browsers that work best are Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Foxfire, iOS, iOS 8 Plus, although it's probably like 9 or 11 now. They work best. Some tablets, Android tablets, if they can use Google uh, Chrome, will work. But you cannot use a smartphone yet. We're getting there. We just haven't paid for it yet in the system to be able to do that. So you, everybody have either a, 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 a Apple-based computer or an IBM PC? Everybody good with that? Um, does your computer have sound? If you don't have sound, it's going to be a very quiet learning experience. Some are closed captions, but not all. We're trying to get to that. Now, here's the two things you need to do before you do this. You must, 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 disable or turn off your pop-up blocker while you're doing it. Because we use pop-ups like many educational other sources do. I'm sure Brockport is no different in their online at all. And you must enable Flash Player. Now, Amy included with PowerPoint tonight a job aid that's about nine or ten pages long that if you have trouble not understanding where to do that or how to do it, there's very graphic things that our IT department has put together as a job aid of how to do these two things. If you're having problems where the screen is really tiny but your screen is really big, there's information on how to fix that, but it's not usually the case. 99% of the time, it is either disabled pop-up blocker or enable your flash player that have caused you grief, frustration, agony, and pain. 
So if you do those two things, you should not have any problems. If you do have problems, again, use that job tool. If you're still having problems, do not stress. Please, please, just call me. I help volunteers through this all the time, walk them through it. I will get you through it in a painless like process. So, when you register for EDGE, this slide is ultra important. If you do not register correctly, you will not be able to take the curriculum. So you're going to go to this website. You must complete all the fields with a little asterisk, and it's not as obvious as I have here, unfortunately. When you get down to the division field, you, use, you, you need to choose disaster function. If you choose another function, you won't get the function that you want. And then you'll be functionless, and you'll be calling me going, Bill, it doesn't work. I can fix it, but I have to go to the background to do that. Organization, you want to choose community partner dash other. Under organization name, SUNY Brockport. Don't type in Brockport SUNY. Don't type in State University of Brockport. You must type in S-U-N-Y space Brockport. Then it shows up on my little reporting tool. If not, you'll be missing, and I go, I don't see any training. Don't know who you are. And the region, you must choose, and it's a drop-down. And by the way, the drop-down, there's a little box that looks like this that you can use to, to it's a lookup tool. You must choose Western and Central New York region. If you belong to another region, we have no idea where you are. We have to send you there for training. And there is not always better than here, because it may not be nice there. It may be sunny here today. Create a password. You have to do it twice. There are some specific rules. You guys are used to that as part of your lives now. And then you have to confirm that you're not a robot. Once you do that, you're in the system. So let's go to the system just for a quick look. Hopefully this works. Wow, we get to choose. Let's choose Google Chrome. There we go. That's what it looks like. Pretty straightforward. There's the point again where you choose your division, you get a pop up. Which you're going to choose, disaster function. And just go down through that list. Pretty straightforward to do. At the very bottom, again, promise you're not a robot. And click a login. And then you have to play this game. I'm going to jump off my educational soapbox for a moment and step on another one. I want to kill the person who invented this. If I ever figure that out in my career with the organization, I will go to jail for murder. This is a pain in the butt to prove you're not a robot. Oh, good God, oh God. You have to select all the images with crosswalks. Okay, well, sometimes they'll stay street signs, and there'll be this little bitty street sign in the corner, and I won't see it. Because I'm old and my eyes aren't good anymore. And I'll miss it, and I'll go, you are a robot. Ha ha. <laughs> Start again. So look carefully when you choose the things, and it takes you through about seven or eight of these to prove that you are not a robot. So I'm going to close the robot. Any questions about that? Again, yeah, you'll have this PowerPoint. It's already in your email. OK. Now, because we're state of the art, we do things by icon. Gosh forbid, we should just explain it in real words. So we'll see three icons and the classes, and we'll get to the classes in a minute, that you will see. You'll see some that are a little calendar. That means they are instructor-led training. Don't choose that one. You have to go to another chapter, which means you have to drive there. And I know you're going to choose one that's like Michigan from 6 to 10 on Thursday night. You're going to be like, I can't do that. I got class. But you're going to show up on their roster, and they're going to go, eh, didn't show up. No call, no show, because they're not going to go in and see where you're really from. But you might want to go to Michigan, so it's okay to choose that. 
What you should choose is the icon that says it's online learning, the little blue computer screen. There'll be two options for some classes. Some classes will only have this, but always choose the one with the green box. Survey says choose the online option and you'll be able to launch, enroll in the class and then launch it successfully and do it on your own time. You'll also see something that's part of a curriculum, a stack of books. You guys are used to a stack of books. All those useless books you buy, at huge amounts of money, and then you're trying to sell them the next week, right? Don't choose the icon one. There are no classes that are part of the curriculum that you are taking. Choose this option only. As you get into more advanced options, you'll choose curriculum, which will be a curriculum, and then it will automatically enroll you in all the subclasses. So if you choose whatever your degree is here, you choose that, it says the abrupt board forces you to take all the subclasses. They have a list of the prerequisite classes, right? That's kind of what this does, but we just don't use that yet. Thank goodness. We tried it, it didn't work well. Volunteers didn't understand, but select the green box, you'll be okay. Okay. Here are the eight classes that you're going to need to start with. Again, they're listed in the PowerPoint, so you don't have to write them down. In a minute, we're going to go into, I'm going to go into Edge so that you can see what they are. So the first one I want you to take is using Edge as a learner. It's 10 minutes. It explains how to navigate within our learning management system. So you don't call me like an hour later going, I can't find the class, so I try. I don't want you to do that in the struggle, so take that class first. It's 10 minutes, it's easy. After you do that one, you're going to take Disaster Cycle Services and Overview. It's an hour-long look at what Red Cross does to help individuals and communities as we do as an organization. You've received the precursor of that tonight with me. This is going to lock that in for you cemented in place. It's a building block. This class is a prerequisite for every single other class that we teach. Every disaster workforce volunteer has to take this class. It's the first one because it's a basic building block. It's foundational training. Master Overview talks about how we take care of people. It's short. It's 10 minutes. Super easy. Feeding fundamentals. And by the way, you, want, you won't find V1 in there anymore, but V2 is what it's called. So we just updated it. It's how we feed people. Food safety. Now, once you learn that, then I'm going to give you the very difficult course. And I will tell how many of you try and do multitasking while you're doing your online learning. Professors, plug your ears for a second. If you're a multitasker, I will tell you this. Unless you're really good in biology and you aced your biology class, don't multitask on this one. Because the assessment that you take at the end names all these bacterial kinds of things and they're close. So you want to make some notes and write them down so you can pass it. Not have to do it three times like I did. Because I multitask the first two and then I think, uh oh, <laughs> I better pay attention now and take it the right way. So pay attention for this one. The rest you can kind of multitask through. It's an hour long. Not hard, but don't multitask. Shelter Fundamentals is one of the longest. It's two and a half hours. It talks about how a shelter works. It talks about the kind of things you'll expect to see in a shelter. God bless you. It talks about those things, what clients will expect, and as a disaster workforce person, what you can expect at that shelter. The kind of jobs you're going to do. The kind of people that are going to come in. When the senator comes in, how do we deal with them? When the mailman comes in, when a friend comes in, how do we feed people? How do we house people? How do we take care of people? And that's what you're all doing this for anyway, so you'll find it's kind of easy. This class will probably be the best class that you will ever take in the history of your career. Psychological first aid helping others in times of stress. It is not a class that you will only use while during a disaster. It's a class that you will use with your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your dog, your family, your parents, your aunts, your uncles, your professors, with friends, at disasters, with your clients. Just like you know basic first aid, when I'm bleeding, what do you do? What do you do when you're bleeding? Direct pressure, elevation, right? Maybe you go to the hospital, maybe not. 
This class is first aid for somebody who is having a psychological emergency. To help them through that few minutes, sometimes hour, to talk them back off the wall so that you can get them to the next step. A really, really good class. Even our disaster mental health people that are certified still take this class because you learn long-term care most of the time, not immediate care. So that's why everybody takes that. So it's a really, really good class. The last one is Concept of Operations Basics. It's a brand new class. It talks about how Red Cross, how we operate in times of disasters. At some point it's going to seem to you when you're looking at this video like, oh my god, why do I need to know this? Because if you want to help in crisis and a disaster, you need to know how it's all put together. And this is a very basic version of that. If you like the advanced version, it's an eight and a half hour class. I'd be happy to come in and teach them one of the instructors. But you won't need that. You just need the basic level. So what happens once you get all this? Your brain is slightly fuller. You have a little more pressure. Your skull's tightening to fit a little tighter. What do you do with this? Where do you go from here? What's the next step? So we talked about what's the next step. Is What might it be? This is your knowledge check to see if you were paying attention the last hour and a half. Come back. You come back. Good. She passes. Move her along. Next one. What else are we going to do? Some kind of simulation. Some kind of simulation. She passes. Mark her through it. What else? You didn't think there was a knowledge check. See, I've been doing this a long time. I'm ready. What else are we going to do? You get that simulation. Where are we going to go from there? What's next? Disaster mental health. We're going to take you to that next step so you understand for that. Now, you won't be able to practice it until you get your license, which I know is a long process. I get that. But you'll be ready. You'll have those tools in your tool belt. How many of you liked Batman? Remember Batman, the original Batman? He had his tool belt. You know, when he was in the ocean, what did he always have? Shark repellent. Like, who carries shark repellent? But it's a tool that he had in his tool belt. How many years have you guys been doing this, this program? Three years? Four years? In the master's part? Three. Five years? Three to five years. <coughs> You've already got a really big tool belt, right? These are just more tools for your tool belt to do your job. Hopefully I've increased it a little bit tonight so I can ask you, what are the two kinds of shelters? Does anybody know? Anybody? Evacuation, post-impact. Right. You learn all these pieces and it just builds and builds and builds your base of knowledge. This is going to get you to the point where you can come to a shelter and do sheltering and feeding. But you say, but wait a minute, Bill. I want to do casework. I want to help people get through the counseling, the crisis piece. This is the neat part. You can become an event-based volunteer and under the direction of a licensed professional, practice your trade. So you can do this as a student or until you get to that point where you're licensed. But once you are, I please hope that you'll reach out to us and become a Red Cross volunteer and deploy to great places like Guam or Puerto Rico or Ohio, or California, or anywhere else in the world that disasters occur. So questions about any of these classes? Questions about any of those? Okay. So, we're getting towards the very end. Then we'll talk some more talking. We're pretty good. Actually, oh, I'm sorry. My neighbor, or my email address, is William.plat, not Bill.plat. There is a Bill.plat, he's not me. I'm William. And my phone number for my office. I may not respond to you that day because sometimes I'm out in the field, in the plane, in the rain, whatever it is. Today I was at Charlotte High School teaching um, our um, citizen preparedness and our hands-only CPR to some hooligans. It's great. Who chose middle school? Don't do it. 
I worked with them today at Charlotte. Don't do it. They're terrible. Oh. Oh. Oh, no. No, these two, they were not misunderstood. They're, ready. They're setting themselves up for a free ride, a free stay in Attica down the road. They're, they're, these two are pretty close. But regardless, I was there today. So I do respond to email. Sometimes it takes me a day or two just because it backs up on what I do. And I never know what my day is, even though it's planned, because disasters occur. And that's my first my first requirement is to respond to disasters in our community. So reach out to me, call me. I'm happy to reach out. I'm happy to call you back. Leave me and tell me a good time to call you back, or I'll reply by email. Hey, let's get together on the phone, whatever. And I can do that with you and guide you through the problems you're having, understanding classes. I want more. I'm excited. I love this. I want to do it. Like, get me out of it. Just tell me what it is. I can talk to you back. I've had the psychological first aid. I can talk you off the wall back to being where you want to be in your program. It's pretty easy to do. Really good at that. So, have that information again. It's in the PowerPoint. If you want to write it down too, you can call me. Um, you can call me at 2 o'clock in the morning, but my voicemail is the only one that's going to answer, not me. But I will help you through this. What our next session is going to be, and I'll work with Amy tomorrow because I, my laptop is not connecting tonight. I had problems downstairs with it already. It's, it took an hour and a half to send that email to her in only seconds. I will confirm a date in August with Amy for this. But what we're going to do is we're going to set up a mock shelter. That mock shelter has four different elements. We're going to set up a dormitory. So the cots are going to be out in the vehicle at the parking lot, just like in a real shelter. We've got to carry them in the building. We're going to go out to the building. So for whatever that day is, hopefully it's nice, prepare for the weather, dress for success. If it's raining, make sure you have your raincoat because we're going out to the truck to get it. I'll have probably the emergency response vehicle with that because it's big. It's been in there. We'll take the cots in. We'll bring them in. We will set them up. We will set up a dormitory. Then we'll take the dormitory down. We'll set up a registration area and we'll do some mock registration so you get to do a little role play, which is kind of fun. I have some cards and some props that makes it a whole lot more fun. We will set up a feeding area. And you will have had the two feeding classes, so it's not going to be a real difficult thing. It's going to be fairly quick. It's basically just saying, yes, I can do this, and I've done it now. You'll set up, you'll do some signage. You get to harness your inner creative skills, elementary, kindergarten, whatever level you wanted them to be at, and make nice signs. Creative signs. And think about the signs that you would need for your clients. By the way, clients are all languages. Disabilities, abilities, all kinds of problems, good or bad, all fit into there. So you have to think about those with signage. But by the time you get through that shelter fundamentals class, you'll have a good idea what that might need to be. But I'm going to throw some loops in there for you to see if you're like, oh, wait a minute. Hmm, where would I, like, wow, where do I plug my cell phone in? Hmm, where's the cell phone station? Because doesn't everybody in the shelter need their cell phone charged? If you brought the charger, by the way. Those of you who brought your charger, you passed. But if you didn't, hopefully somebody will let you borrow their cell phone. So you'll get through that. Let's see. So we set up feeding, dormitory registration, yep, and signage. Do that. Normally it's about four to six hours. We have a smaller group, 14 people. If you've all done the classes prior to that, you will have no problem sliding right through that. It's really quick. And it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of laughter in that class. This one's kind of quiet because you're just absorbing. That one you've already learned it and now you get to practice and play. And after the first like 450 to 500 cops you set up, uh, you'll get an associate's in cotology. At, at like 800 to 1,000, you get a bachelor's. Goes up from there. When you get to 10,000 cops, you get a PhD. And you can tell by picking up the bag what aluminum was made out of it if it's missing any parts. I'm in the like master's program right now for cop. 38 years. A lot of cots. And you'll get to lay on a cot, which means that's good, because you'll know that your clients are going to experience where they're sleeping. And by the way, it's not a bad place to sleep. They're pretty comfortable. I've done 48 days on a cot. That's the longest I've done. And it's not bad. You get very into your home space, your little 4 by 6 cot. So, questions any so far? 
So, how are you feeling? What I gave you tonight? Did I do well? Did I not so well? You laughed, you cried, you kissed two hours goodbye. Good, bad? Do you feel like good? Good? That's good. Thank you. So, register. Get the PowerPoint from Amy or email. Register yourself. Amy's going to send me, once you register, please let Amy know. Amy will build a little spreadsheet or whatever, or a list, a bullet list, whatever, I don't care. Your name, first name, last name, your email address, that's the two things I need. I don't need your phone number, although that'll be in that system. So I can look for you, and I can grab you and attach my name as your system manager to you. So I can, if I need to help you, I can do that very easily. I have to go digging for you in the system. And once we do that, we'll be on our way. We'll set our next date. We'll go from there. You may decide that in this time between now and August, because hurricane season's starting, uh, that's part of my life, and you see something on the news and you go, oh, I do have that training. I want to have Call me. We will get you in the system and get you all brought in, and we'll deploy you. And then you can go out for two weeks and you can practice what you've learned somewhere in the United States, probably the South, Texas, Louisiana, Florida, Georgia. Those are the normal places. Arkansas, they left tornadoes. Tornadoes can be coming up, that's always fun. So, so if you've got the time and you want to go do it, it will be the hardest job you've ever done for the least amount of pay that you can't wait to do it again. And that is true. I have never met a volunteer who has not who's gone out and said, I don't want to do this again. They usually say, Can I go out again? Really, 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 really. Like, sure. Let me know when you're ready. We'll send you out. We just have to have a job for you to send you there. Red Cross takes care of the entire cost of you getting there. There is, excuse me, no out of pocket money for you unless you want to buy toys while you're there to bring home. Like trinkets for families. We pay for your food, your travel, and your life. You just have to bring the clothes you wear, lots of work attitude, and willing to take care of people when they least expect that they're going to get any help. And you'll have a great time. If you're interested in doing some other things locally, because you can't travel, you have kids or wives or jobs or other things in life that happen, let me know that you're interested in volunteering with Red Cross. We have all kinds of stuff that we can help you do. Little jobs, big jobs. You can be part of our home fire campaign, you can go out and teach pillowcase project, you can all those kinds of things. Those of you who are in middle school, please sign up and see me. We will get you to help us teach the rest of the high schools. Because I can't get through it. That's a tough one. If you're doing that age group, God bless you. <laughs> you are a saint of saints to be able to do that, that population. Wow. I thought the high schoolers were bad, the middle schoolers are like, wow, crazy. So, absolutely amazing. So, that's all I have for you. Any questions? Good. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate your. You're very welcome. Tonight and. Uh,